Hi there, I'm Brandi Bernwald, the Director of Alumni Relations at Ferris State University, and welcome to this evening's Alumni Social Hour, A Smoking Good Time, Meet Smoking Tips and Techniques. Tonight, we're going to receive a little education on smokers, spices, differences in meats, and other tips and techniques that will have you smoking in no time, or at least with a better understanding of the process to get you started. For this presentation, there were no supplies that needed to be purchased ahead of time, Tonight, just sit back and relax. The event will be roughly 60 minutes, and any time during the presentation or at the end, you may click the Ask a Question button near the bottom of your screen, or type a question in the comments section if you're watching us live on Facebook. We will work in the questions when possible, or definitely catch them at the end of the presentation. And you don't have to worry about taking notes. If you miss any part of the presentation or would like to go back at a later date to review a section, you'll be able to play back tonight's social hour beginning tomorrow on this website under past events or on our Facebook page at Ferris Alumni. And now a little bit about our special guest this evening. Casey Payne is a 2008 graduate of Ferris State University from the Construction Technology and Management Program and is the Senior Environmental Specialist with VRX Incorporated. Casey and his family currently reside in Fort Worth, Texas, where he spends most of his free time creating the perfect smoked meat. Having competed in numerous barbecue competitions over the past five years, he has made a name for himself and his Smoke and Seven barbecue company with a special brand of spices. And without further ado, I turn it over to Casey to introduce his special guest this evening and begin our March Alumni Social Hour. So let's get smoking, Casey. Thanks, Brandy, and thanks Bulldogs for tuning in. Hopefully along this tutorial over the next hour, I can teach you guys a couple things or we can uh, ask some questions, try to get where we need to. I uh, couldn't do this alone. I had to bring somebody in from the from the area who is also a Ferris grad. Uh, he's a grad of the criminal justice program in 05 and is a proud public servant in the DFW market and is also a team member of Smoking 7 Barbecue. And let me introduce you to Ryan Bloom. How's everybody doing? Thank you for joining in tonight. So if anybody has got any real quick questions, throw them up in the chat and we'll, we'll start from there. Um, we'll give it like 30, 40 seconds. See if anybody's got anything. If not, we'll go right into the first start of the first start of this. Um, a little bit about myself. When I moved down to Texas after attending Ferris, kind of got heavily into the smoking scene and it just absorbed all my time and got more and more involved and just continued to do it, developing, getting better. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I do is self taught. So it's uh, may not be the best, but there's certain people out there on the, on the uh, competition trail that like it, the judges. So I've done all right with that. Um, but you never know what you're going to get into. Everybody's palate's different. So cook the way you want and eat the way you want to. So, uh, Ryan, do you see any questions yet? Not yet. Okay. All right. So first of all, we'll start. We're going to go over three types of smokers. Uh, we're going to go over pellet, a charcoal wood vertical drum, and we're going to go after a offset style smoker. Uh, we're going to go in order of beginner to hardest, starting with pellet, then moving on to the, the vertical drums and then to offset. So let's uh, do some moving here. There we go. All right. So this is an example of a pellet grill. Uh, this is a particular brand called Green Grills or a GMG for short. Um, for the beginner grill, it takes what are pellets. They're, it, a lot of people think they look like rabbit turds, um, but there's different flavors you can get for different types of meat, and it fuels fuels this. It travels through the firebox into an auger system that goes into the to the cook, main cooking chamber. And there's, a, there's an ash pot and a fire pot that starts down below this that begins to smoke. And it 
actually goes into the smoker and then exits out the smokestack. Um, this particular unit is a fairly inexpensive unit, but I personally chose it because of its capabilities. Um, there's, there's lots of other brands on the market. Um, for me, knowing going into this, I did my research on this. Uh, this particular unit's about 60 pounds. And if you can see the legs down here, they actually fold up into handles and you can pick it up and carry it. It's perfect for your fire state tailgate game. Um, and then, you know, you can run it from your house you can run it off your vehicle directly into what some of the elder people may call a cigarette lighter for some of the youngers who may not know what they are, but that's what they're originally designed for. Or you can hook it up directly to your battery. So this is a really cool unit that you can travel with. Uh, I've taken it in my camper multiple times to camp with. Um, additionally, with the, where are you at, Ryan? There you go. This is the, the book that comes with it, but in that book, it actually has different recipes that commend or how to show how you can cook with stuff on there. And it, it's from one end of the spectrum to the other, but you can read through this. But the real cool thing is, is Green Mountain Grills, and this is what the advantage they had over the other brands, is that they have an app system. And the app has all these recipes in there, which are called profiles. And the profiles can actually be set up where you set it up on your phone after connecting the smoker via uh, Wi-Fi or mobile data. And you just basically hit go and it will cook your meat for you. So you could be at your, your football game or your kid's soccer game, you know, miles away and it will run for you. As long as you've got pellets, you're good to go with it. It's really cool. It's one of my favorite units that I have. Uh, relatively on the low end of pricing and they're they're pretty versatile too as well so that's the it's called the davy crockett unit they make three units but uh so that's that's what i like to use on my and uh, the weekdays i like to cook on that one let's see if we've got any questions no questions yet all right oh we got another question here what do we got uh, do I have a list of products or spices for sale? As bad as this sounds, my website is down currently. I'm having some issues with my provider. Uh, I do have some products here. Um, if you guys are interested, we can talk when this is done and I will get some out to you. Um, I don't want to talk about a salesman here while we try to do this. So uh, we can try to go forth with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question here. Which choice of wood for briskets, pork, or butts? Well, honestly, um, we can get in that a little later, but my personal favorite on pretty much everything is pecan wood. And I can get in that a little later. So moving forth here, Ryan, let's switch cameras here. All right. Now y'all get to look at Ryan. And he is going to talk about a vertical drum. Another different, another aspect that you can actually do is actually the vertical drum um, or UDS or ugly drum smoker. One of the benefits of this is pretty simple for anybody to use. There's only one in, one air intake and one exhaust, and through that process, all you got you can leave the top vent open in order to cook whatever meat you're using. The other good thing is there's a basket, so you just load that up with some charcoal. And as you load it up with charcoal, move your grates. So what we're showing here is this is a baffle plate that's been used. Uh, it helps with the airflow and keeps the fire reduced. And we can give them that in a second. And then it can be any size. This is a 12 by 12. You can load it up as you load up with charcoal. Pick that back up, Brian. We'll show them something cool. This particular basket is we've got a good premium lump in here, lump charcoal. You can see here. Uh, burns a little different than your standard brick heads. 
But this particular basket, as you can see, it's got some spots down here. So when the ash starts to form or the, the lump burns out, it actually falls down below instead of getting down to the bottom of the drum. So you don't have to clean the bottom of the drum up. All you have to do is clean the basket up. It's easier for cleaning. And then as you smoke with it, there's several different ways to do it. Uh, one of the big ways to get it going is actually with some tumbleweed. And with that tumbleweed, you can throw two or three of them in there into the chimney. Load this up with some charcoal and put a little bit of tumbleweed in there and get it going that way. Tumbleweed's a lot better because that way you're not getting that lighter fluid taste in your meat or anything along those lines. This is completely tasteless. You will not taste anything from it. I don't know about you, but I don't have, I haven't owned lighter fluid in years. I probably haven't used it in probably five or five to eight years, really. So I don't know if I own any. <laughs> so the good thing is with this is that way you don't get that taste of the lighter fluid. You can throw it right into the charcoal and that way it will ignite it in that chimney and then you can dump it into that basket. There are several different ways you can do it. You can put the tumbleweed right into the basket, start it up that way. Another way is to start it in a chimney and then dump it into the lit charcoal into the basket. Two different ways of doing it. Neither way is wrong. Um, I use what's referred to as the minion method. Dump a little bit of charcoal into that basket, put a little bit of lump wood into it, like so. Dump that in there. And as I dump it in there, put it around the sides, dump a little bit more charcoal in, cover that up, the wood up, and then put a little bit more charcoal in. And then I take that basket and I dump it in there of the lit charcoal into it. It's the easiest way to do it for me. Everybody's different. I, I personally do it a different way. I uh, I light my charcoal with the, the tumbleweeds, or I've actually used a uh, a paint gun that you can buy at your local hardware store or your harbor crate. Um, Weed burner works really good. As yeah, well. weed burner works as well. Basically, anything that can create a safe burn for you, it, it, it'll light charcoal in a heartbeat. Um, but those tumbleweeds are an amazing product, and not to push a particular broad product, but they, they work great. Throw a couple of them in there, and you walk away in 15 minutes, you've got lit charcoal. It's, it's great. And by doing that, that way, as the charcoal burns, excuse me, as the uh, charcoal burns down and the wood burns down, Constantly getting that smoke going into it. That's that's why I personally like it. Again, neither way is wrong. As you get it going, we'll take the, baff, the baffle plate, put it right over the basket down at the bottom of it. Then take your griddle top and put that down as well over it. And then at a good distance, depending on how you're cooking. Cook the meat. If you want a good solid char, you're going to want to put it a little bit lower with no baffle plate. That way you're getting that direct heat and direct smoke right onto the meat. The good thing with the drum is, is it's so easy because of the simplicity in it. You only have one vent you have to worry about. It's going to be right here. And that's what's going to choke down the temperature and everything else with it. Because obviously a fire needs oxygen. The good thing with the drum smokers or ugly drum smokers or however you know them by, it holds the heat in so much better than most other smokers. Except when you get into the more expensive ones, which we will get into here in a little bit. It holds it in, it allows that heat to rise, cook the meat, then exit through. Oh, this is part of the the setup here where it allows it to automatically lock. Yeah. That, there we go. All that heat will then exit out through the exhaust, almost, almost working like a regular kettle and or to a certain extent, the crock pot. Because all that heat's being held in with a little bit of heat getting out. That way it allows that meat to break down allow the fat to break down and allow it to continue to cook in a slow, methodical way. So these, these type of drums, they're, 
when you can build them about anything, um, built multiple of this. This is one of them I built myself. Brian's got one at his house that we've built for him. Um, they're they're basically smokers on steroids. Uh, this this particular unit, you can do a brisket running at a higher temperature, upwards of four to six hours, maybe depending on the size. Uh, you know, every every cut of meat is going to be a little different, but they they cook so hot and so efficient that they are they're, they're great to use. You set them and you walk away. If you've got a higher grade or a good premium lump charcoal, they will work great for you. As long as you can seal it, you get a tight seal on them, keep that, that heat and airflow inside, they'll, they'll run for hours. And you just set them and walk away. They're good and just, cookers. And just last weekend, I did that 10 pound shoulder and it took 10 hours and I only had, they didn't have to refill the basket. So because of that, how well it holds the heat, it allows it to cook so much longer and, and a lot slower as well, which is a huge benefit. So that way you're not going through bags and bags of charcoal as you're cooking. Any questions? Okay, you got a couple of there in regards to the electric. Let's go back here. All right. I, d I don't use electric smokers. Um, these are three of my personal collection that I have here. Um, I just, I've never really gotten into them. Um, I just, my most electric is going to be the pellet smoker. Um, I just, I just never really tried them, honestly. I, d I just don't, I personally, and it's not to knock the electric smoker, I don't think they produce the kind of flavor as other styles do. Um, but you have to be able to buy what you can afford or what you want to use. I mean, I started off on a $40 drum smoker from Walmart years ago, and I taught myself how to use it. I've killed a lot of food, a lot of horrible food. I've eaten a lot of barbecue sauce and a lot of food. Um, and I still mess them up today, but as to the electric, I really don't have a whole lot of experience with them. I hope that answers your question. Uh, precise temp control with the barrel smoker. Is it time and time based? Well, realistically, there's ways of doing it. Um, and this can get into, I guess I'll get into it now. Um, I use a product by Thermoworks called the Billows. It actually plugs in down to the bottom of the barrel. It's a fan system that I can control with the other half, which is this is the Smoke X. This is the four probe system where I can put three different types of probes into the meat. And then one goes on to the grate and it tells me the internal temperature of the smoker. And based on where I set it at, this fan will blow. If say I want to set it at 275, this fan will blow until it gets to a certain temperature and will cut out once that temperature has been met. It's, it's kind of an experiment game with it, but they help if you're, especially in cold climates, they really do help well. Uh, is there a price control temperature barrel smokers? Yeah. So, and, and with the, with the drums, it's the, the top, and the air intake that you can open wide open or you can close a little bit. I personally run them wide open um, and adjust the, the exhaust from there. It's, it's really learning about how your particular smoker runs. Each smoker is going to run a little different. So playing with it, buying a cheap cut of meat and expecting to screw it up, I guess we'll say, is is uh a good practice i hate to say spending money to, to screw something up but there's always barbecue sauce and buns to be able to put it on something if you don't don't get it perfect so like for casey he, he'll run his wide open i have to crank mine down in order to maintain a decent temperature i can usually keep my my drum anywhere from 250 to 300 pretty consistently and and that gets into another idea between hot and fast versus low and slow I personally, I like to cook hot and fast. Excuse me, hot and fast. It's just 
I find that it produces the same amount of product as low and slow, but less time. I mean, time is money and I don't want to sit outside for 10 hours if I can do it in five. It's just well, how I am. Degrees, I like You're correct. Time. Yes. If it's nice outside <laughs> and you get inside and have a couple drinks or enjoy what you got, sure. But my type of cooking, if I had to pick one, would be hot and fast. I just, it's just what I like a little better. So just a few weeks ago, I ended up doing, get, kind of give everybody an idea on how big this drum really is though too. I did eight whole chickens cut in half on my drum and I was able to do eight in roughly two hours with cranking the heat all the way up to about 400 to 450. But then again, that was also with the rack very low because you can set your drum up any way you want. Um, mine set up a little bit different than Casey's um, by his recommendation. Um, we we built his up to be able to cook chicken. Yes. That's what he wanted. His has a internal rack system inside of it that can actually has five different settings inside of it where the rack can go down to five different levels. And on the fifth level, it's sitting right on top of the firebox. Um, my system is, is set up for two sets of different grates in there. Um, it's just, it's really, you can get online, go to, you can type in UDS or ugly drum smokers, and there is tens of thousands of however many different models you can build or look at. I mean, there's zillions of pit builders for them. Uh, you know, the, the key is, is if you're going to build one, do a little bit of research, but start out with a food grade drum. That's, that's the biggest thing I can recommend to you. You don't want to get an oil drum and cook it because that oil will get in your food and you're gonna get sick. That's that's key, you don't wanna get sick. Um, with the food, grade, the food grade drums, they do have a liner in them that you gotta burn off. Usually a pretty good fire in them, or you can take a weed burner and burn them out. They're red. Um, you burn that out and you're good to start building. So you do it relatively inexpensive. I know guys that have built them for 50 bucks and then the guys that build them for over 1200. So it's really what you want into them. And you can set it up however you wish. I mean, there, that's the good thing about with the uh, barrel smokers is, cool. what, a couple hundred different ways to Oh, there's, it. I yeah, mean, it's, yeah, there's. It, it's all going to be your personal preference. Yep. It's, they're really cool, really versatile. Um, you know, you can go into the hardware store and get most of your parts. So they're, they're pretty cool. But starting off with a good drum is the first thing that you need to start with. Uh, next question I see on there, will the pack brisket fit on the pellet smoker? Depends on the size of the, the, the brisket. A packer? Yes, it will. Will it? Yes, it will. it will. Yes, it really depends on the size. Um, obviously, if you go get a 20-pound brisket, it ain't going to fit on there. I think you could probably, on this particular one, maybe a 12-pounder, probably about the size of it, big as big as you can do. The other thing you can always do is you could always split the point and the flat in half and cook it that way. Um but they're going to cook at different temps, different times. So let's see. Questions in control. Do you brine your chickens? Oh, there's one right before that. Yeah, we'll start with that one. Uh, how easy is it to control the temperature? I don't know what a uh, UDS is. All right. Ugly drum. Yeah. A UDS is what they refer to as an ugly drum smoker. Um, basically, you buy the drum, you burn it out, and you just build it. That's how they got the name as an ugly drum. Uh, it's very, very, very cost effective way to get things done uh, as far as uh, building a smoker. It's a cheap, cheap build. Um, it kind of goes get, goes back into me talking about the, the billows and the yes. smoke axe when I had a previous question a little bit ago about that. So the... Uh, Temperature control is actually very easy. Uh, once you figure out how, and this is one, one important thing to remember too, is every drum is going to run a little bit different. Um, I know with mine, I can usually keep, get it locked in quick and fast. And that's usually keeping it, when I see the temperature start rising, if I want to run it at about 250 or whatever it may be, with or without the baffle uh, or the heat shield. So it, let, me, it, let me stop you there. For the baffle might be something new to everybody. The baffle allows for airflow to come through. Um, and it also helps from fires raising up 
and singeing your meat, say, um, it, it, it's, it's really good for airflow and it helps the smoker to stay consistent. Uh, a lot of your proteins will drip, you know, whatever it be, if you brine it, if you inject it, or just the natural products dropping off it, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to create a singe on the, on the fire and it could smoke it. It could stand a new, a new, uh, fire, grease fire. You never know what it's going to do. So that baffle plate almost works as a, as a protector of the fire as well. And one good thing also with the, the ugly drum too, is you can do it with or without that heat shield basically yeah, in there. Yep, yep. And there's there's two reasons for that, and you kind of touched on it too, Casey, is by allowing that moisture to hit, you don't also have to keep a water pan in there like you do with some, right. yep. with some smokers, yep. not all, but yep. some. Yep. That way you get that natural moisture coming up in there. Um, that that That's just my take on it. I mean, there, other people may disagree, but that's Again, it goes funny. down to what, what do you like? What do you like to do? I mean, do you, you know, what's your, what's your style of cooking that you want to do? Experimentation. That's, that's the biggest thing, you know, and once you find out what you like, run with it. That's, that's the key. Uh, your question still sitting there about your brine. All right. So in regards to the brine, I do my chicken several different ways. Um, for me, I, it depends on how I want to cook it. it. And that's just my personal taste is, do I want it to have a little extra flavor to it, like a little extra juice? Because that's that's what it comes down to. I will sometimes brine it, sometimes I won't. Uh, sometimes I will also inject it. Uh, obviously, being from Ferris, one of the, my favorites is beer and butter inside my chicken. Uh, it just adds that extra moisture within within the chicken meat itself. And and when I usually do brine, I will usually go a little bit slower because you already have all that ingredients on there it's already started to kind of partially cook the chicken meat and the skin itself so is it the rest of the question there says any tips uh the thing with chicken and you can do it on any type of smoker or even a, uh even a, your gas grill uh you do want to cook it at a higher temperature and that that's the key because if you cook it low and slow, like they say, chicken is a sponge. Any poultry is a sponge. It's going to absorb that smoke and it's just going to take it and take it and take it and take it until you pull it off. Um, and, and if you put too much smoke on it, it's going to be nasty. You're not going to want to eat it. The dog's probably not even going to want to eat it. So it'll get dried out. It, yeah. And that's the other thing is it gets dried out. So the key is, is that if you cook at a higher temperature, it, it helps um brines do help some people put butter on them some people use mayonnaise actually underneath the skins and put it on the skins there's there's different tips and tricks um and that's the, and this goes back to the drums again drums are amazing for for chicken that's that's why i started cooking on them for comps is cooking my chickens on the drums because they're so versatile and you get them so you can get them so hot and they just they just do very well for the chicken compared to a standard offset that you just get the smoke and you don't, you don't get the, the direct heat like you do on a vertical drum smoker. You, it uh, just allows for a much better product. The good thing about the drum is it's pretty, and I'll use myself as a perfect example. A drum is pretty much idiot proof. If I can run it, anybody can. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple it, in regards to cooking. You really, you're going to have a hard time screwing it up. I mean, that, that's just me. If you, if you cook either on the grill or not, I mean, that's one of the big things is if you actually pay attention to what you're doing, you're fine. Yep. And, and always allow yourself to have a little extra time. If you get yourself in a bind, that's when problems happen. If you start rushing yourself, you're going to try to introduce more heat or, you know, whatever or it is, or drop the temperature. You got it. You got to set yourself up a timeline and give yourself extra time. Um, and this is why we're going from easiest to hardest. Um, I guess with that, we'll go to the to the offset. So this is a custom offset smoker. Uh, I had this 
made for me a couple years ago. This is my favorite cooker of all that I own. It's probably the one that I at least cook on because of its size. Um, probably about eight or 900 pounds. As you can see, it's on golf cart wheels. It moves extremely easy. Uh, I can move it by myself, but it's easier to have two people. Um, it's a standard flow versus reverse. So standard flow, firebox chamber, uh, smokestack. If it was a reverse, the smokestack would be over here. With that being said, airflow comes in here, your firebox down here, which I'll get into in a minute, but it goes out the firebox, through the cooking chamber, into the collect, out the stack. A reverse flow, this isn't here, it comes down and there's plates actually that force the smoke to stay underneath and it circles back around to the top, from the bottom of the chamber to the top of the chamber and then goes out the collector off the stack. Uh, the big question is, people are asked, why reverse versus a standard flow? Really for me, it comes down to a personal preference. Um, there's people out there that say a reverse flow is a more consistent cook. Well, that's, that's their belief. Um, I personally don't think there's any proven facts or paper out there that the way that they really do cook. Um, I've cooked on both. My personal preference is a standard. I've cooked on it a lot. It's not a great system. And it's, it's raised out of airflow. Actually, I'll focus here. So your air intakes are here. You can, just, you can stack your wood up here. Um, I usually start with the charcoal, a little bit of charcoal, a few sticks. Um, again, my personal favorite to use is pecan wood. And it's just standard Texas pecan right there. Um, pecan's a real, real easy flavor. It goes with about everything. And mild. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm trying to just show it off a little bit. And it's got crates here that come with the food with me. Um, I was going to tell us if I cooked down. But both these chambers are they're pretty, they almost cook identically. Uh, and as you get to know the smokers, there's going to be hot spots usually. Um, and favorite spots where you like to cook at on. But they, uh, this one, for as big as it is, and again, I cook hot fast. I get up 300 about eight to 10 minutes with two sticks of wood and some little bit of charcoal. And it will stay consistent for as long as I continue to feed it every hour, two hours, it'll stay at 300 degrees. So uh, just kind of, for those of you that don't know, these are uh, a weighted system that are on here. So these doors are very heavy. So when you open it, you don't have to rip your arm off to open it. So it's a it's a counterbalance is what it is. So it allows it to open smoothly and close smoothly. So they, and they, this, as I said, this is my favorite type of cooker to cook on. Um, obviously it's the biggest and that's not why. It's just, I personally find it the most fun. It's the most involved. Uh, this is the one that you have to stay up all night long and cook on. I mean, this is, this is the one. And you know, when I cook on this, I get about 30 to 40 minutes every hour, two hours in that time. So usually come the next day when I cook, I'm a little Casey, Ryan, I think we've lost audio. Casey? Casey, we've lost audio. He keeps talking. This is what happens when we do virtual. 
television. Well, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties right now, so please stay tuned. Um, we just need to get the guys' attention here so they can adjust their audio. And we'll also try to have them move it a little bit over so that they can, we can hear when Ryan's speaking too. So one minute while we try to get his attention. Perhaps he's checking. So that's got audio, right? Okay. All right, it looks, are we back live? Somebody, let's mute that on the top. All right, it looks like we're back now. Sorry, it looks like we lost the connection. All right, so I don't know where we were. I guess we'll, I don't know where we got cut off at, but I'll just pop right into a question here. Uh, do you cook breasts differently? Actually, no, there was another one in there. I saw it. It had the question about, there it is. Uh, do you use egg smokers? I do not, and I have nothing wrong with them other than I am very abusive on my smokers, and I am really scared to spend that kind of money on a ceramic cooker because uh, I don't want to shatter it. <laughs> I've got dogs. I've got kids. I've got a buddy that comes over and could get a little violent and knock my smoker <laughs> over. So that's really the only reason why I don't have one. And I don't think my wife would let me spend that kind of money on one either, or additionally to what I have. Um, but they do cook great. They're, they're so versatile. Um, again, another set it and forget it kind of thing. You I mean, you can, you can cook pizzas on the thing. So, um, and this, this goes back into the drums again and how versatile they are. The drum is in my opinion, the cheap egg cooker. Um, they may not hold the temperature as well as an egg, but they also don't have the flare ups on, on them like the eggs do. If you don't know how to cook on them properly, it's, it's all, it's all a learning process. Um, but don't, don't be afraid to jump in. And I think we got cut off. Um, but ask, ask the, ask the people that have a little more experience. If you're looking for something, you know, be open to new ideas or opinions, uh, Get get what you think you know, or look into know, look into what you're going to buy beforehand. Do the research, um, and then make the decision based on what it is. Uh, join a social media page. That's that's a big thing right there. But be ready for a lot of different spectrums of answers. But somebody's always going to help you on those. Um, hopefully that answered your question. What's that next one? Do you brine or inject to season other meats like pork butt or brisket uh, or just rubs for those and other chickens? I do I, both. Yeah. Uh, I do not inject at home or for anything other than competitions. 
competitions are all about injections. That's that's the key. Um, at home, I don't I don't inject. I personally don't enjoy the flavor of some of the injections. So with with competitions, it's you get one bite and you have to give your best product you can. So you got to put a lot of additives to it that you probably don't want to eat a lot of. And, and that's exactly why I always keep it basic with like a uh, beer or butter injection, because that's something that everybody inside the house can eat. And that's just that's just me. I won't go out and buy any of these special injections that are out there unless I just want to try it yeah. for like if we have something coming up. And that's just me. I, now yep. rubs, yes, I will rub everything. Yep. That I will put whatever and anything I can on it that tastes good. What you like. I mean, yeah. that's that's it's gonna come down to palate. If if we walked into my my kitchen right now, I have an entire probably four shelves full of different spices. That's just it really depends on what you like. I mean, you know, I don't know of anybody that wants to eat a cheeseburger for three weeks straight. That's just not how it works. I mean, you know, you don't want the same thing every time you cook. You you want to change the flavor up if you can. So if you find something you like and run with it, sure, but eventually it's going to get old. So be open to new ideas. Try different stuff. Uh, you know, that's that's really what comes down to pellet, as Ryan said. And the next one, do you cook breasts differently than thigh or drums? I do. I usually do breast offset because it's a little bit leaner meat. With the uh, thighs and drums, that there's usually a little bit more fat in those, so I'll usually cook those a little bit high and fast, hot and fast. Excuse me. Yep. And it really depends on how if you've got skin on or skin off. I mean, yeah. When you're when you're smoking, you got to get that skin as crispy as you can because otherwise it's going to be like shoe leather. I mean, I've never tried or shoe, rubber. Yeah, or rubber. <laughs> I've never eaten shoe leather or rubber, but I imagine it's not going to be tasty. So I've I've experienced some bad chicken. Let's just say that. So there's, you know, the butters, the sprays. I mean, you can try the the extra virgin olive oils to spray on them. That helps. Um, I usually pre-rub with. Yeah, yeah. But the oil. the key is is cooking at a higher temperature to achieve more done skin. That's that's does that make sense? Yeah, because okay. like and, and that's like and for me, I mostly cook on a drum. So for me, when I do it on the drum, I usually take the heat shield out, so that way it has that direct heat, so that way it crisp it up, crisp the skin up almost perfectly. And I've sent Casey pictures of what I've done and everything else, and by no means am I an expert or nor am I, but. Yeah, me personally, I like the skin to be a little bit more, have a little bit of crisp to it. And yep, yep. Go yep. with that good old fashioned yep. backyard barbecue yep. style. Yeah. So we'll uh, with our little loss there, we're kind of a little behind on time, but um, so your your pork butts, your chickens, your beefs, they're all graded on a particular scale from USDA. Um, Pork is, is rated from utility from one to four, um, and it's based on a fat thickness and muscling. Uh, utility is usually, you know, bottom of the barrel. Level one is is kind of climbing, two, three, and then four being your best. Um, it's hard to determine what you're going to get with pork, being that, you know, we buy it from a lot of you know, your Walmarts, your Myers, or whatever it be, but it's definitely Kroger. edible Kroger, yeah. Um, but you know, if you get a four, that's the best you can get. That's probably more than what I need to be talking about, but just for your general knowledge. Uh, your chickens are graded A, B, C. Uh, C is normally bottom of the barrel, it's normally cut up. Uh, B sometimes gets distributed to the general public, but it depends on how the bone structure and bruisings are. Um, but most is cut up as well. Your level A grade is what you find at your lot of your stores, your butchers, whatnot. Uh, and it's free of broken bones, defects, cuts, bruising. It's got to look good for the people to buy. So that's what you're probably going to buy. Your beef, I think about everybody knows. You've got your select, your choice, your prime, and your wagnu all in that order. Um, 
I don't cook a lot of Wagyu personally. Um, I just don't really like to spend the high dollar of it. I cook a lot more prime than anything. Um, and then your choice and your select, it, it really depends on, and they're all labeled. If you go in to buy, say, a brisket, it's going to have, if you flip it over, it's going to say what it is. Um, if you go into Walmart, you're either going to find a select or a choice. That's that's what they carry. Um, a little little tip to the trade to you is a lot of your suppliers, your your Walmarts, your Myers, your Krogers, whatever store you're going into, uh, the suppliers have a quota that they have to fulfill. And sometimes they cannot give that particular cut. So say they buy, you know, umpt amount of choice briskets and the supplier cannot produce that many choice, you may find a prime in there. And if you're lucky, you get that prime at a price of a choice or a select. I've done that many a times, but you got to go look to find them. So that's that's the key there. Um, obviously, you're going to notice a difference in taste if you cook them properly. But all in all, my favorite cut is a prime. I mean, Ryan, I don't know if you have a different opinion on that. I've yet to master how to do a <laughs> uh, brisket, so I'm going to keep myself out of this. I've, I've cooked a couple in my life, so I'm going to do all right with them. But steaks and all that, yeah, they, I use prime or choice. What do we got here? Uh, all right, so we still don't have any questions. Anything on? Nope. Okay. Um, yeah, just been back there in home base trying to show off a few of my cooks. But um, tools of the trade, I will throw this one out here. This is a MK4 by Thermoworks. Uh, I have a case on it, it glows in the dark, and it is magnetic. Um, this is actually a gift from my wife because I wanted one for so long. But these things are amazing. They are accurate as can be. They hold up. Uh, I have a buddy that uh, runs a restaurant. It's a rotisserie style smoker that he has. He actually set it on one of the racks to do something and moved on to the next protein he was using. 14 hours later, he realized that he had lost his thermopen. He found it. The screen was blacked, but he could still read the screen and it still worked. Uh, and this is where Thermoworks stands by their product. He sent them an email with a photo. They asked for the product back and they sent them a brand new one. Uh, there's multiple accounts of people screwing these things up, but they keep ticking or Thermoworks stands by their product. Um, as you can probably see, it's 78 degrees in Texas right now in my garage, but they're instant. I mean, they're, I mean, I'm putting it on my hand and it's already dropping. I don't know if it's going up. So, it's they're great products. They're great for spot check-in. Um, if you have to buy anything, this is really what I recommend. They're a little pricey. Uh, I think this unit without the case, the magnetic spread around 100 bucks, 80 bucks, somewhere in there. But they do have sales. Um, if you get on their emails, they drop the price and you get a few bucks off here and there. But they're this is by far my favorite tool in all of my stuff. I know Ryan's got one. And the good thing too with those two, I will say this, even though for those of you that may be cooking outside or anything like that, if your wife makes candy during Christmas time or during the holidays, that temperature on that will actually hold during the cook process yeah. of candy as well. Yeah. So, I mean, that it, it can kind of be a win-win for everybody in that aspect. And they're waterproof. That's yeah. another thing I forgot. Yeah. The other good thing with them too is it's only what a quarter of an inch as into the, the gauge on it. Yeah. They're tiny. So I mean, basically where that little line is, is, yep. That's all that you have to stick it yep. in and it'll be instant right here. Oh, right there. Yep. Yeah. I'm fun with the camera. <laughs> um, I showed earlier, I've got another system by them. I'm, I'm a big fan of their products. I'm, not sponsored by or anything like that. I wish I was, but uh, these are just, they're good systems. They hold up. Um, if you're actually thinking about buying something, do not buy it off Amazon. Uh, they're actually in a lawsuit with a supplier that is fraudulently selling their products on Amazon. Uh, they are not Thermoworks products. This has been going on for several years. They're in a big old hoops lawsuit. Go to their, their website. Um, I don't know if you can, 
Ben back home. I don't know if you can give a website out to him. They did on the uh, Facebook. Okay. Page. So yeah, it's thermoworks.com. You can go on there and play around. Um, but they, they're amazing products. Uh, I know Ryan's got something called the dot. The uh, good thing with that, and I will say this too, is it's literally just a little circle about yay big. It's a leave in thermometer. So you can stick it into your meat and you can get an idea of where your cook is going. The good thing about it, the one I have is called the blue dot. Uh, it constantly reads the temperature. You can change how how often you want it to read. I currently have mine set at five seconds, so that way I can constantly see the temperature changing. The good thing with it is it comes with an app, like every other ThermalWorks product, yep. that is a leave-in thermometer yep. key. You and, they, and they actually, it's not to cut you off, apologies. they just did a big update on it. I haven't even downloaded the new software yet. So I'm I, every time I talk to Ryan about it, I'm like, I got to download it and then I forget. But it's, uh, I hear it's, it's really cool. It's a really good app. So the good thing with it is you can leave it in and be inside your house and constantly watch temperature change and go from there. So that way, if you, and you can set an alarm on it as well. I'm pretty sure you can probably do it with one you have yep, too. Yep. Set an alarm. So if you want them to say your cook's done at 205, if you're doing like a pork butt, uh, set that alarm at 205. Hear the alarm go off on your phone. You can turn around, go out there, take it off, and let it rest. Um, I need some more questions, guys. Come on. Uh, so we'll move on to, as they're saying, going to tools and equipment. Um, there's a few of them, but, you know, you can get on the websites. You can get on the Amazons or the sites and buy the – the other products, but in my findings, you're just going to buy another one after that. Um, this particular MK4, I think, is going on six years. So that's just word to the knowledge for you. Uh, what's a what's a dot run? Uh, about sixty bucks. And John uh, Willoughby, you are exactly correct. They are awesome products. Yeah. So if nobody has used it, I suggest investing yep. in the money. Yep. That's one good thing is... They make great Christmas and birthday gifts. Or Father's Day. <laughs> yep. Uh, so if you were to go buy a smoker, say tomorrow or even tonight, whatever, uh, next couple of days, something like that, what's what's good to cook for a beginner, eating, intermediate, or skilled smoker? Um, I'll tell you this. Pork is... Uh, I didn't nope we're back we're still good um, it's it's the most forgiving as long as you cook it to if you're cooking it to slice it you want to cook it to 145 internal temperature if you want to if you want to pull it you want to take it over 200 and you want to make it soft so um, oh, Ryan's pushing me to question here I have a question last one <laughs> Beer of choice for injection. Uh, I do not inject with beer personally, but I think Ryan has a <laughs> – I would assume it would be some sort of light or heavy beer. But what, what are you going to tell me here, Ryan? <laughs> I, I've used a little bit of everything. I've used everything from Miller Lite all the way up to good old – Um, It's one of those beers that either one will work. It all depends on what you want your meat to look like after you get done cooking. Obviously, if I'm doing a white meat, such as a chicken breast or something along those lines, I will use a light beer. If I'm doing uh, a, a steak or anything along those lines, if I want to inject or red meat, I will use either, believe it or not, either red wine. Yeah, yeah. red or, wine's great for it. Even with game. Or, game yes. game is a game, you know, your, your venison. You know, even you could probably do it with um, I've turkey. A, I've done a marinade with. Yeah, yeah. Wine is amazing. Venison, venison yeah. Yeah, wine and, is great. And when for I it. say don't go out and buy any uh, Grand Travers, yeah. there's no reason for that. Just find the cheapest bottle of $6, red wine. $6 bottle of red wine. You'll be two, fine. Two buck chuck will work yep. just fine. Yep. So <laughs> there's a second part of that question there. Uh, when you pre-rub with olive oil, do you mix your spices in the olive oil and then rub? Or All right. So me, I'll put the olive oil on first, and I use it as a binder, uh, similar to like what I do with my pork butts. I'll use a mustard. 
and then I put my rub on it. Uh, how do you do yours on uh, your own? When I do a pork butt, I usually will just season it. And I want to, and most, and the good thing is with pork is it, it can hold a lot of seasoning. And that's one thing that throws a lot of people off. They think they have too much on there and you probably actually don't have enough. Um, just like even any red meat for that matter, you got to let the rub sit. And for me, I always go by look. I don't know about you, Casey, but once it starts sweating and it looks like it's wet, that's usually a good indication that would be a good time to put it on. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Or something new, or is that the last? I think that's the newest one. Uh, let's see. Do you mix your spice? I will usually only, in regards to the other part of that, uh, with the olive oil or any type of oil, I will only put about roughly a tablespoon to a just, tablespoon and a half. Yeah, minor, minor. Just yeah. enough to add a little bit to it. Yeah. Uh, and the only reason I do that is because you're going to end up seasoning it more, and that's just – that that's me. I, I, I'd rather have it be a little bit more flavorful, but I also don't want it to the point where it's over-seasoned. I hope that answers your question. Oh, looks like we're back. All right. Okay. Now we're back. Sorry. We're having some connectivity problems. Looks like we're good to go. All right. So uh, as I was saying, it looks like we've beaten pork to death. Uh, beef. Beef's kind of middle of the road. All right. I don't know what's going on. We're, we're trying here. Um, could be that distance between Texas and Michigan. I don't know. Sad joke, dad joke. Um, but beef can be, beef can be tricky. Uh, brisket takes, takes time and understanding how to cook it. You can't just go buy it and throw it on and never do it. You're going to, I'm going to tell you from experience, you're going to mess it up. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the more you do, the more you learn, just like anything else. Uh, and I go back, ask, ask somebody that knows, what they're doing go if you got a friend that's cooking a brisket and they've done a few ask if you can see what they do um unfortunately i'd love to sit there and show you the prep of everything we can do but we don't have enough time to do it it takes some time um prime ribs same thing i mean you know watch watch the videos uh a big one that i started watching when i first started getting into this was malcolm reed with yes. with killer hogs uh, I think his YouTube page is how to barbecue, right? It's BBQ. How to, how to, how, sorry. Yeah. His YouTube, YouTube. page. Um, Malcolm will go over everything and step by step. step, by step. Uh, he is a great guy. Personally, I've met him before. Uh, he will tell you everything he can give you except for his competition injections and rubs. But if you've got an at home question for you, I'll answer you. Um, but some, what's his name? Uh, California guy. Oh, are you talking about? Oh, yeah. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. He's another good one that will take you step by step yep. as well. There's there's a lot of stuff out there. I mean, you can get on YouTube and look. He's my days looking. Um, my dad's gotten into cooking. He actually bought a GMG like I do, and every time he cooks something, he calls me for a recipe. So I, I send him the same way. Dad, get on YouTube and find something. And then he learns something and asks me, and then I'll walk him through it. You got to start somewhere. That's that's the key. And then once you, you get into it, then you can ask the questions. You know, you can't you can you can get the step by step basis of it, but it may not work for you. It may not. The process, you might want to do something else. Um, and again, chicken, in my opinion, is probably one of the hardest things to cook because of the skin doneness. Um, high, high temp. Yeah. High, high temp. Do's and don'ts. 
I'll tell you from experience right off the bat, uh, one of my first ever barbecue competitions, we partied too hard. And we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> we barely got our meat in. Uh, our chicken wasn't cooked. So uh, a big one, allow yourself extra time especially if you're feeding guests or you're having a party. Um, don't throw something brand new on there that you've never cooked. Um, now, if there's people you want to upset or try not to tell them to come back to your house, do what you want. And but, nice. yeah, that's that's your, <laughs> your, your comment, not mine. But, uh, yeah, so take the practice. Uh, don't be af afraid to fail. I think we've talked about that already. But – Continue. You're going to fail. Um, and you're going to learn from your experiences and learning is going to be teaching. So and find out what works for you. Uh, not everybody's palate is the same as yours. Um, me personally, I like a lot of pepper in my stuff. And I don't. So, um, you know, do what works for you. Um, and again, reach out if you've got questions. I'm glad to help you. But uh, we just had another question pop in. Oh, <laughs> A lot of fun. Thanks. Appreciate you tuning in. Um, I guess we'll kind of get back to the back of it. I know it's one of the first questions. I do have a line of rubs. Um, I'm not trying to do any sales on here, like toot myself up or anything. But uh, currently my websites are down. Um, you can shoot me a message, uh, smoke7bbq at gmail, or you can hit me up on uh, – Instagram or anything like that. I do have a limited quantity right now. Uh, the bags sell for ten dollars a piece, and the shipping's about eight bucks. So um, I'm doing everything through PayPal right now. I'm, I'm having a lot of problems with my website. So um, if you are interested, send a message. I'll get what I can out to you. Um, we'll go from there. Let's see. Do we have any more questions here? We did. We did have a little fun earlier. So, um, can we see on that camera? Oh, we got to switch it around. So, that might be hot, Ron. So, we did a little... So, we did a little... This is kind of a Texas thing here. that We like to do in Texas. Normally, we wrap those, but it's just Ryan and I. <laughs> These are beef ribs, also called plate ribs. Six, seven, eight ribs, they're huge. Uh, they're, they're, uh, as you can see, I mean, they're massive, but, let my hand go. <laughs> but, so just a real quick example, as you can see here, there is a little bit of a smoke ring. That's, that's due to a breakdown in the connective tissues. Um, you want a good smoke ring, put them on cold. I'll leave them like that. Or room temperature. Yeah, so don't, don't, don't go too warm with them because you won't have that good temperature or that good ring. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? Get them in now. <laughs> We're watching. All right. Looks like we're all right. I think that's about it. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Hopefully you learned some stuff and you can uh, maybe cook some food. I'm available. If you guys want to shoot me a message, I'm, it's fine. I'll do what I can to answer you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Casey. Don't go away yet. Um, okay. First of all, thanks for making us all hungry, showing us those ribs, because, you know, here in Michigan, Ben and I aren't chewing on any of those right now. So thanks for that. And then I'm not going to brag, but I am lucky enough to have some of those spices um, that Casey talked about and has um, sent me, and uh, they're, they're pretty darn good. So I know he doesn't want to toot his own horn here today, but 
Um, I, I don't know if you want to talk just a little bit about them. My family uses the white more yep. than we use the red. So um, uh, and, red was my first I ever made. I originally made it for pork, um, but it's been kind of developed. It's amazing on pork. It's it's pretty much I do. Yeah, pork and game. Um, but I am currently out of red, <laughs> so I don't. I have. I think I gave Ryan because he was bugging me. I gave him the rest of my personal stash, so it's not much. Uh, I think I've got about a case of white left. Um, and they're actually they. I don't bottle anymore. They come in packages. I can grab one. Else. But um, they're the same thing. They're just a package now, but you don't get to shake her. Um, if you saw I'm the beef, show, that, right? yeah, uh, the beef ribs are done with white. Um, it's a it's a salt pepper base, and then there's a few other I don't want to say proprietary, but ingredients that are in there that uh, really push things over the top. Um, I personally built it for my likes, and I've had a lot of success with it. Uh, been doing white for about three years now, and it's hard to keep in stock. Let's just say that. So I'm. I take everything. I, I don't use a a, um, a bottling service. I go to a clean kitchen and make everything small batches myself or I get somebody to help me. Um, so it's it's almost to the point where I've got to find somebody to start bottling everything for me. So it's, it's, it's very good. It's very good. Um, we use, like I said, the white more than we do the red, um, probably because we're using it with the beef more often. Red's but we do a little kick to it, too. Yeah, but we do cook a lot of venison, so yeah. I didn't know that about the red. So I will try yeah. the red with the venison. A couple of other questions real quick um, that came in that you may have missed. One of them was regarding taking temperature. Yep. When you are taking temperature, do you reuse the same exact hole or do you poke it into different spots along? The way? It, it, it depends. Um, you can bounce around. You, you know, it depends on the type of meat you're cooking, too. So Ryan's, Ryan's over here eating. Hold on, I gotta show you if my camera wants to work. Help me out here, Ben. Oh, there we go. He's over here snacking on the ribs. <laughs> right there, yeah. um, it, it really depends on, you know, for brisket, I'll pop around, um, you know, because there's two different meats in a brisket. So you've got your, your point and your flat. Um, so I will and I won't. It really, I cook brisket to a, Temperature over 200, and then I cook it to, to texture. Um, for brisket, you want to cook it so it's almost like connect, like butter. Um, and these beef ribs are just like brisket. They were cooked the same way. Um, the the nickname I give these are brisket on a stick. But What's I, the paper that you wrapped it in? Oh, so that's a peach paper. Um, it's real similar to – well, I don't want to handle it because my hands are this nasty still, but um, – it's a so peach paper versus uh, tin foil is the big question. Uh, when I cook competitions, I use uh, foil because, in, in my opinion, that the foil will cook a little bit faster. But at home, it really depends on what I'm going to cook in. Uh, pork butts, I use foil because I like to reuse my juice that comes out of them. Um, briskets and and uh, Beef ribs, I use the peach paper because it allows it to breathe and it keeps a little better bark. Um, so it's really a personal, personal preference. Um, it's but so if you if you want to go to the store and buy some, a lot of people think the the paper from like Home Depot or Lowe's and like that or Menards, that's not the same stuff. You need to look up peach paper. The the stuff that's white that has the consistency has a bleach in it, and you do not want to cook with a bleach. Um, Amazon sells it. You can get it if you want to try it. Use it as Amazon. Um, I don't know where else is around. In big rafters, we got people from all over the place, but Amazon's good for about everything. So, and is are there any good safety tips for those of us that have never done this before? I'll burn your house down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay. Good. That's the big one. Yeah, I've I've lost fires where it's gotten close. I've singed grass. Um, the biggest thing is, is well, here's a good one, uh, and this is probably a classic one, and, and I've seen it done. People cooking with propane grills. They put them too close to their siding and burn their grill or burn their house. Um, you know, have enough distance away from the house. If you can set it up in the yard, set it up in the yard just in case something goes bad because 
a yard's easier to replace than a house. So, you know, you might you may have to go spend the night with your in-laws, and some people don't like that. But um, the other big thing are gloves. I mean, you don't want to burn your hands. It's, you know, I've, I've got for the drum, these are actually a new pair I just ordered. They're welding gloves. They're like 15 bucks. So handling hot stuff. Um, and then I've got, no, oh, they're over there, just simple cotton gloves that you can put on. And then I put surgical gloves over top, and that's a lot of the times that I'm wearing. I mean, it's just they help. Um, there's the heat gloves you can buy. I haven't had good success with those. So that's that's surgical personal. gloves with the cotton gloves. You will not feel the heat. Yeah, actually, go grab those those cotton gloves. I'll grab those. And with with COVID, surgical gloves are so insanely priced now. But I mean, this these are simple Harbor Freight. I mean, they come in like a pack of ten for like five bucks, seven bucks, something like that. And then just put them on and put your glove over top of them, and you don't feel the heat. So plus they're kind of sanitary too, so that helps. Yeah. What else? Well, awesome. Thank you guys so much. I, you know, I know today was a little difficult in Texas. Yeah. A lot of storms went through. Um, thank you for moving into your garage for us yeah. to not yeah. do this presentation. Sometimes we just have to go on the fly. Mother Nature isn't always nice to us. But yeah. I think you gave us a ton of great information for any smoker out there or a want to be smoker. Um, not to mention that you made us all very hungry. So <laughs> thank you very much. I, I, I do appreciate you allowing us to come in to your garage in Texas tonight to show us those ins and outs of creating um, the perfect smoked meat. Thanks and I want to know also another special thank you to Casey, who serves as our Bulldog Ambassador in Texas. So if you are joining us from Texas, then make sure you connect on Facebook to the Lone Star Bulldog page. And then you can stay up to date with Casey and Ryan um, as they kind of take you along with some alumni gatherings in the area. We're trying to do some new things. When we get the OK to go out for COVID, there's a couple of good things in the works. And uh, if for some reason you can't. You can't find the page. Uh, my name on Facebook is CM Payne, um, or hit up Brandy or send an email anywhere out there. We'll get you linked up and we'll get you in there. So awesome. we're on we're on LinkedIn and we're on, no, we're not on Instagram, but the LinkedIn is a little slow. Um, but Facebook's kind of where we do a lot of communications through. But you can always go through Brandy or Lynn, and they'll they'll get the emails over and we'll get you set up. Awesome. Well, you guys have a good night and enjoy those um, ribs. We and will. Oh. Ryan's ready. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. As a reminder, if you miss any part of the presentation or would like to go back and review a section, the video will be found beginning tomorrow on this website under past events or on our Facebook page at Ferris Alumni. And if you're feeling inspired, we would love to see some photos. So feel free to share a picture of your smoked meats. Um, on our Facebook site, and we will share those. Next month, we switch gears. It's golf season. So join us for our uh, April Alumni Social Hour, Swinging into Spring, Tips and Tricks for Perfecting Your Golf Game, which will be Thursday, April 8th at 7 p.m. Spend an hour with us as we meet our new FSU head professional at Khaki, as well as an inside peek at the Ken Janke Center. And, um, Edition will have some current students from the PGM program. They'll be on hand to walk us through proper, proper posture, golf swings, and much, much more. So for more information or to register, simply head on over to the Alumni Association website at ferris.u backslash alumni. Thanks again, everybody. I hope you have a great evening. Stay safe, Bulldogs.